The subject of European Union regulation of genetically modified insects is not yet a hot topic. However, given the rapid and stunning changes in science and technology, it will become a important subject in the future, perhaps the near future, particularly because insects can directly bear on the lives of humans, such as insects that cause disease and insects that lead to widespread destruction of crops. Genetic pest management capitalizes on recent advances in biotechnology and the growing repertoire of sequence genomes in order to control pest populations. Insect genomes can be found in genetic databases such as NCBI and databases more specifically relating to insects such as fly base, vector base, and beetle base. There is an ongoing initiative started in 2011 to sequence the genomes of 5,000 insects and other arthropods called I5K. No doubt, just like computer technology, the overall abundance of information in the future will yield a rich pool for technologists to draw on. A genetically modified insect may be produced from a variety of different techniques. Mutagenesis is spontaneously or from exposure to mutagens. This particularly starts in the early 20th century as scientists became aware of the effects of chemicals and radiation. Transgenesis is by introducing a transgene, an exogenous gene, that can be passed on. It can be facilitated by liposomes, enzymes, plasmid vectors, viral vectors, pronuclear injection, protoplast fusion, and ballistic DNA injection. Cisgenesis is where genes are transferred between closely related organisms. For insects in particular, the sterile insect technique is pride of place. It developed in the 1930s and 1940s. It was used in the field in the 1950s. Irradiated male insects are released, they mate with females, and non-viable eggs are laid. The sterile insect technique uses mutagenesis and is very simple and straightforward when compared to other methods. Some genetically modified insects are used for genetic experiments, while others are pest or disease vectors. For this lecture, we'll be discussing particularly pest and disease vectors. For many mutant insects, it's difficult to quantify their value in terms of their impact on humans as well as their scientific value. That's not the case for fruit flies. Thomas Hunt Morgan began using fruit flies in experimental studies of heredity at Columbia University starting in 1910 in a lab known as the Fly Room. Morgan and his students eventually elucidated many basic principles of heredity, including sex-linked inheritance, epistasis, multiple alleles, and gene mapping. The fruit fly has been a critical animal in the study of genetics and provides a useful template for insects going forward. What exactly can be done genetically to a living organism like an insect? Dominant lethals, or RIDL, is a control strategy using genetically engineered insects that have or carry a lethal gene in their genome, which is an organism's DNA. Lethal genes cause death in an organism, and RIDL genes only kill young insects, usually larvae or pupae. This lethal gene is dominant so that all offspring of the RIDL insect will also inherit the lethal gene. This lethal gene has a molecular on-off switch, allowing these RIDL insects to be reared without dying. The lethal gene is turned off 
when the RIDL insects are mass reared in insectary and are turned on when they are released into the environment. RIDL males and females are released to mate with wild males and their offspring die when they reach the larval or pupal stage because of the lethal gene. This has been used particularly for the yellow fever mosquito, the diamondback moth, the Mediterranean fruit fly, and the olive fly. Now we can talk a little bit about the olive fly. Across all EU member states, there has only been one national application, and particularly focusing on the country of Spain, not surprisingly since it's the olive fly, for a trial release of GM olive flies in accordance with Part B of the legislation 2001-18 EC. There have been no applications at an EU level for commercial release. The legal regime is basically untested. The legislation 2001-18 EC directive provides for the advent of new GM techniques which rely upon in vitro methods to directly modify genomes. These techniques are covered by EU law in its processed-based approach, where the technique used decides if the particular legislation applies. In EU law, a GMO does not need to contain foreign DNA to qualify as a GMO. The directive refers to, and I quote, an organism in which genetic material has been altered in a way that does not occur naturally by mating and or natural recombination. Industry claims that detection methods will not be able to tell the difference between a new GMO and a traditionally bred organism. This might be true, but of course the legislation is only designed to apply to artificial or artificially produced organisms. It's important at this juncture to consider the Mediterranean fruit fly, which is a global agricultural pest. They infest a wide range of crops, over 300 varieties, including wild fruit, vegetables, and nuts, and in the process they cause substantial damage. The company Oxitec has developed GM males which have a lethal gene that interrupts female development and kills them in a process called prepupal female lethality. After several generations, the fly population diminishes as males can no longer find mates. To breed the flies in the laboratory, the lethal gene can be silenced using the antibiotic tetracycline. Th this gave rise to an opposition movement in America and particularly I'll mention the Council for Responsible Genetics. CRG was founded in 1983 and organized a 1985 congressional briefing and a 1986 panel of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, both focusing on the dangers of genetically engineered biological weapons. However, they also cover such mundane things as food production. Helen Wallace from Gene Watch, which is the CRG magazine, stated, and I quote, fruit grown using Oxitex GM flies will be contaminated with GM maggots, which are genetically programmed to die inside the fruit. She suggested the mechanism of lethality would likely fail as GM flies evolve resistance to tetracycline which is widely used in agriculture. Now back to the Spanish example. After contained trials, the modified olive fly strain was ready for a field trial. The company Oxitec made an application to Spain under Part B of the directive in late 2012. Spain could not authorize the trial without additional data and significant containment measures. Oxitec withdrew the application. They likely didn't want to set a precedent that this kind of treatment would be required in the future. In 2015, 
a new submission was made, but concerns remained regarding containment and confinement. Additional measures were presented. The application was withdrawn again. Oxitec states the government of Brazil and the USA has recently allowed environmental release outside of netted enclosures for self-limiting GM insect plant pests based on identical technology. To some degree, it is important to look at what is going on in the various legal regimes of different countries because they tend to follow precedents even from other legal jurisdictions. Now we can leap to the issue of mosquitoes. This is perhaps a more pressing issue than agriculture because mosquito-borne diseases can cause death to humans. However, environmentalists are divided about this issue. When using GMO mosquitoes, in an ideal world, no pesticides are needed and therefore it's good for the environment. However, people on the other side of the coin who still might be environmentalists say that GMO mosquitoes are simply too dangerous to release. Before considering the present, it might be a good idea to look at the future. What scientists are aiming for in terms of the ideal insect of the future. And if we talk about genetically modified mosquitoes in the future, we can envision something like a transgenic mosquito with an effector molecule. This would interfere with the development cycle of a parasite or virus. The problem would be this transgenic mosquito would likely not have a fitness advantage compared to wild mosquitoes. The gene would have to be developed at a faster rate than simple wild type uh, inheritance. In other words, a very good understanding of the mosquito genome as well as the uh, the pathogen would have to be um, gained by this point. It would have to be resistant to mutational inactivation. It would have to evade pathogen resistance and it would have to uh, yield an organism that was efficient and robust in order to compensate for any loss of fitness when compared to the wild type. Now if we return to European legislation, or at least the United Kingdom was European at that time, in 2015 the House of Lords Science and Technology Committee launched an inquiry to address the following questions. Which human diseases across the world could be addressed through GM insect technology? What are the possible livestock and agricultural crop applications of GM insects across the world? Are there any potential applications of relevance to UK agriculture? Do the current EU and UK genetically modified organisms regulatory frameworks work for GM insects? And how can the gap between regulatory approaches and public concerns over GMOs be addressed? This inquiry was very forward-looking in that they understood that the legislation of today may influence the scientific outcomes of tomorrow. The public has a variety of concerns about GMO mosquitoes and some of these are linked with a general unease of genetic modification, in other words creating Frankenstein-like scenarios, and Others are linked with environmental concerns about tampering with an ecosystem. In no particular order, GMO mosquitoes may carry or develop unknown pathogens, and not enough testing and observation has been made of GMO mosquitoes. This suggests that scientists could create something that they would not be able to control. Native species are now reliant on mosquitoes for their diet. For example, species of amphibian could be dependent on eating mosquitoes. If you remove them from the environment, you would also remove these frogs. GMO mosquitoes may mutate into a stronger mosquito that can reproduce, which poses a whole new threat. 
And this means that scientists could introduce a new kind of mosquito, the GMO mosquito, into the environment and whatever impact that, that might have. For pesticides, only areas that have humans need to be sprayed. This reduces the impact of an insecticide. However, with a GMO mosquito release, obviously this would take place over a wide area. Most pesticides have been ruled safe by the government, if you trust the government. So why risk a GMO release? There's the fear that some of the hatched GMO mosquitoes might survive into adulthood and would breed. And finally, the cost of producing these GMO mosquitoes might be too expensive and too time consuming when compared to effective methods of traditional control, such as pesticides or destroying mosquito habitats. The promises of GMO mosquitoes can be used as a counter argument for the problems. And to some degree, these promises are based on the technology as it exists now. GMO mosquitoes will lower the population of disease-carrying biting insects over time. Field testing of GMO mosquitoes has not found any significant impact on humans. Loss of invasive, and of course the operative word here is invasive mosquito species, will have little or no effect on local environments since the mosquitoes don't belong there to begin with. This is different in the case of areas that have local mosquito species that have evolved in an ecosystem over an extended period of time. Of course, the most obvious plus to using GMO mosquitoes is that no pesticides are used in the environment, or perhaps less pesticides are used. Seeding areas with GMO male mosquitoes is a relatively easy and low-cost activity. The introduction of GMO mosquitoes can supplement existing control measures. So, in other words, the traditional uh, infrastructure of mosquito control can remain in place while GMO mosquitoes are introduced. Some people are very sensitive to the issue of genetically modified organisms. This was brought to the forefront in a good example, the meeting of the Florida Keys Mosquito Control District in Marathon in 2016. It was a very contentious meeting. At that time, for five years, the district had been working with the British company Oxitec to get federal approval for a trial release of mosquitoes in the Keys. The company releases genetically modified male Aedes aegypti mosquitoes into the wild. When they mate with a the female, their offspring will die. However, people do not trust the government, and this includes the Mosquito Control District Board. In trials in Brazil, the Cayman Islands, and other countries, Oxitec has shown its GM mosquitoes can reduce the population of Aedes aegypti by 90% or more. But after five years, a small but vocal group of residents is not convinced the mosquitoes are safe. And in fact, they have suggested, as here, that their community is the experiment. This is a serious public relations problem and something that may stop the development of genetically modified mosquitoes. Now returning to the European situation, Directive 2001-18-EC has specific provisions about the deliberate release of organisms. Part B deals with research trials and is assessed nationally. In other words, research trials have one level of assessment. Part C deals with commercial release, and this requires EU approval. This does make sense because commercial release would make an organism able to uh, spread across the entire territory of the EU. 
a real issue with a lot of legislation is the effect. The effect in theory and the effect in practice. The current regulatory framework for GM insects in the EU is outlined in two directives. The first is Directive 2009-41EC. Its main interest is preventing the escape of GM microorganisms. The title of the directive is On the Contained Use of Genetically Modified Microorganisms. However, this regime covers all transgenic GMOs created using recombinant DNA technology, including both GM crops and GM insects. The wording of the directive also uses the word vector, which can apply to the release of disease-carrying insects. And talking about this directive, it says in part in Article 4, member states shall ensure that all appropriate measures are taken to avoid adverse effects on human health and the environment which might arise from the contained use of GMMs. And two, to that end, the user shall carry out an assessment of the contained uses as regards the risks to human health and the environment that these contained uses may pose, using as a minimum the elements of assessment and the procedure set out in Annex 3. In other words, there is a definite framework for assessing how contained genetically modified organisms should be treated. And continuing with that directive, the elements of assessment include disease to humans, including allergic or toxic effects, disease to animals or plants, deleterious effects due to the impossibility of treating a disease or providing an effective prophylaxis, deleterious effects due to the establishment or dissemination in the environment, and deleterious effects due to the natural transfer of inserted genetic material to other organisms. Now it's clear after reading a detailed list of the points by which the organism will be assessed, it is focusing on microorganisms. And in fact, a number of the things look quite self-explanatory, if not obvious. However, it's important to realize that this framework legislation provides ways of coping with a complex problem. And in fact, if criteria like this were outlined in America, protesters could use the legislation to bring specific heads of complaint against uh, bodies like the mosquito abatement districts. And talking specifically about EU regulation 1946-2003, the regulation provides for the implementation of the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. It facilitates prior informed consent before a GMO is exported. Regulatory requirements, with the exception of the Cartagena Protocol, only apply to trials and commercial releases within the EU. In other words, not outside the EU. In all likelihood, the main applications of GM insect technologies, particularly for public health purposes, will occur outside of the EU. This makes sense in that other places are rather like the Wild West. Anything goes. It's possible to do an experiment in an area particularly without any relevant legislation. It's also clear that for things like mosquitoes, that's a tropical problem and that the majority of genetically modified mosquitoes will be released in the tropics. And here it could be Africa or Asia, even including states in America like Florida or California. The regulation was not designed with GM insect technologies in mind, but is, is rather an extension of the legislation for genetically modified crops. Regulation is based entirely on the basis of risk without a balancing of benefits. In other words, the law does not take into account the pros, it emphasizes the cons. It is the process rather than the product that is regulated. Self-limiting population replacement strategies 
are considered in the same way as self-perpetuating population replacement strategies. This is important because, again, it is the process that is regulated, not the outcome. Now to refer briefly to Cartagena on 29 January 2000, the Conference of the Parties, sometimes abbreviated as COP, to the Convention on Biological Diversity, adopted a supplementary agreement to the Convention, the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety. It protects biological diversity from the potential risks of GMOs. It establishes an advanced informed agreement procedure so that countries can make informed decisions regarding importation. The protocol contains reference to a precautionary approach and reaffirms the precaution language in Principle 15 of the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development. It's important to recognize the problems with Cartagena. There is no consistent internationally recognized regulatory protocol or convention for the testing and release of genetically modified insects. Insects, unlike crops or other GMOs, are not usually contained by national boundaries. In fact, there is a lot of dispute as to if national boundaries can contain crops. The case is even clearer for insects with wings national boundaries will not form any bright line for an insect with wings. Increasing global import and export trade means that insects can essentially move across the world. In 2014, WHO produced guidelines on testing GM mosquitoes. While they did not propose a regulatory framework, it is a clear practical document that discusses elements that could be part of a regulatory framework in the future. Professor Anthony James from UC Irvine commented on GM mosquitoes, and I quote, the issue of how to get regulatory approval for the testing of a new technology when there was no dedicated agency to receive and review our applications was not trivial. Applying our checklist criteria, we identified Mexico as the only country at the time that had a horizontally and vertically integrated regulatory structure that could assure complete and ethical approval. And as he says, Brazil may be there now. This shows that there is a clear impact. Legislation can impact science, and it can also impact the product that would have a direct bearing on life quality. It's often said that the mosquito is the most dangerous animal in the world, perhaps the most dangerous next to humans. But anyway, according to the World Health Organization, mosquito bites result in the deaths of more than one million people every year, and the majority of these deaths are due to malaria. It's a pressing concern to find a way to control malaria worldwide. Clearly, the European legislation is not ideal, but the situation in America is perhaps even further from that ideal. Thank you very much for your time.